Welcome to the Damn Short Film Festival. Um, my name is John Labonte. I am the festival director, and I will be the moderator for today's filmmaker panel. Um, the filmmaker panel at the Damn Short Film Festival is, has become a tradition. It's uh, something I went through when I was a submitting filmmaker here, and it's uh, usually a lot of fun. In the past, we've held the uh, panel in an auxiliary location, like the Filmmaker Lounge or someplace else. And two years ago, we brought it in to the uh, Boulder Theater here, which is just beautiful. And uh, uh, it looks great from the amazing crowd here uh, to see everybody up on stage. We're, we're so glad you're here. Um, no one has seen any of the questions that are to be posed to the panel aside from myself. And I would like to start by introducing our panelists. Why don't we, uh, Mary, why don't you start and tell us uh, your name and the name of your film. Hi, I'm, oh, that's loud. Uh, I'm Mary L. Woods. I directed Me Corazon, which is screening tonight at 6.15 p.m. I'm uh, Clinton Cornwell. I'm the director of A New Leaf, which is screening tonight at 8.15. My name is Pablo Benelli. I directed Gas Mask, and it'll be playing tomorrow at noon. My name is Robert Sickles, and I directed American Lawn, which screened yesterday at noon. Hi, my name is Lisette Feliciano, and I directed Better Off Alone, which is screening tonight at 8.15. I'm John Ryan, and I did uh, David's Dream, and that's going to be tomorrow at 9.45. Okay, great. Um, let's jump right in and... Uh, pick a topic here. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the festival circuit. Um, all of you uh, up on stage here have been successful at not only making a short film, but getting it out on the festival circuit and getting it accepted at some film festival somewhere, at least here, if nowhere else. Um, what are some of the big challenges, Marielle, in getting your film seen on the, on the circle? What are the, what are the hard parts about submitting your film to a film festival and getting it accepted? Uh, well, this is the first film that I've taken through the festival circuit. Um, and it's definitely, I think we can all speak to this, but it's a, it's a big learning curve of the whole festival world in and of itself. Um, I think in terms of difficulties, you just have to have a strategy, um, whether that's, trying to find the festivals that you feel like you fit or just submitting to as many as you can. I mean, the whole point is to meet other filmmakers and to get your film seen by as many people as possible. Um, I'm not really sure in terms of difficulties. I guess it's kind of one of those things that you kind of just have to learn by doing um, because it's you can read as many books as possible. And I did read a lot of books and talk to a lot of people about finding the right festivals and how to get your film seen. and. It's funny because you think, you know, you think the ones that you have these kind of third area connections to might, you might have a better shot at getting in if you like send them an email and they're like, oh, well, my mom's from Texas, so like I should get shown here. But none of that ends up really mattering and you kind of just have to take that in stride and realize that uh, your film's gonna get programmed where it fits a program, and I think that's what some of the, the best festivals and something I've encountered here is that uh, there's, it's thematic and it feels, it's not willy-nilly, it feels as if it's, it's part of, it's supposed to be part of that block. Great. Clint, did you have a, a strategy when submitting your film to film festivals? Not a particular strategy, I've just, uh, I think it's important to have kind of a thick skin when you're putting a film on the festival circuit because Oftentimes you're screened by one person on one day when they're screening many, many films. So if they just, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it that you have no control over. And if somebody's just in a bad mood or don't, your film doesn't really fit the aesthetic of the screener that you're with, you can get turned down. So oftentimes you kind of have to take a shotgun approach to applying to festivals uh, just because there's so much that's out of your control when you're submitting to them and just, you know, hope for the best. Obviously the quality of your film helps and Sitting, submitting to the right places and having a good strategy as far as thematically and where you have connections help, but even under the best circumstances, you can still get turned down. So you just got to have a really thick skin. Uh, well, what about you, Pablo? Did you have a strategy for submitting on the festival circuit? Uh, our strategy was just submit as many as we can, you know? Um, so that <laughs> just keep going, keep going, just submit to it. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we had was just like, after a while, it's like the finances, you know? Uh, you're kind of balancing that. It's like, 
well, you're going to submit to these big festivals, and they cost a lot more money than these, but is it going to get in? So this is the first time that I've ever been to a festival, and this was the first film that submitted to a festival. So it was a big learning curve for us, but um, we're here, so we're happy. Yeah. Um, Robert, do you, do you, um, you mentioned how much it costs to submit your films to a film festival, and that's something that we hear, you know, here as an organization is I ran out of money uh, to submit my film. Um, did you include a budget item, a line item for submission fees and travel to festivals? I mean, because of the time you're done in traveling, you know, paying all the fees and submitting and then traveling to them, you could have made another film. So did you include it in your budget? Yes, I'm, I'm in a very unusual position um, for my day job. I am the director of film and media studies at Whitman College, so kind of the program there. So they actually pay for me to go to festivals. Um, so I don't have the same limitation that way. I can't go to endless festivals, but they'll pay for me to go to anywhere from four to six a year, depending. So that's not a huge issue, but the, uh, the submission is definitely a huge issue, and you have to, I have to pay for that kind of out of pocket. And yes, I definitely have a budget, and yes, it's definitely not uh, limitless. And it has changed a lot. I, um, I attended my first film festival in 1999 and have been doing it pretty, pretty much nonstop since then. And I submit to significantly fewer festivals than I once did. Um, I still submit to Sundance every year and they've, who knows how much money they've got off me, but it's the dream, right? But like, I don't submit to Toronto, New York, whatever. I'm very limited on the major, major fests that I've, um, that I have, uh, submitted to, not because of doubts in my own ability, but you can look at the lay of the land and see what they're accepting, et cetera, and know what you're making and the kind of festivals that are likely to take it and be, be reasonable uh, about it. Doesn't mean you can't dream, but you don't need to follow every dream. So, okay, so you're very selective about yeah, the festivals. Sure. Lisette, your, your film was made on a, a real shoestring budget, yeah. if I understand it right. Was, was uh, submitting to festivals like your biggest line item? Absolutely. John's talking about my film. It was made for $20. Um, so, yeah, my biggest line item has been festivals um, because any one of those, I could have made like three of the films by now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think that's one of the funniest parts about filmmaking is that, especially when you're starting off, you get so into your production that you completely forget about post-production or P&A and distribution, and that's honestly where most of the leg, um, the leg work is because, great, you can make your film, but if nobody knows about it, you're not really going to get too far. Um, so I, I actually have to have this fight still with a lot of producers and say, we need to have this much money for festivals. We need to have this much money for promotion kits. I mean, Without a Box helps a lot because they have the online promotion kit. But it's still great to come to a festival and have a piece of paper. I don't think we're doing that today. Um, but yeah, I think that's, for me, that was the thing that I had to do the most with uh, my films is always, always push for... Uh, for P and A budget. John, it's your third visit to the Am Short Film Festival this year. We're so glad you're back. We must be doing something right if if you keep coming back. Um, what do you What do you think about uh, the cost involved in submitting to film festivals? Has that been a hurdle for you? Um, no, because those are those are costs that you have to factor in in the beginning. I think. Where, where things get blown out is during production, when I forget that we're not just feeding actors, we're feeding a bunch of other people too. Or, you know, because a lot of times uh, you go to do something and, I don't know, something small, like, oh, we need a picture hung up, so you have to go buy, you know, whatever, a picture, and you spend 10 bucks here and there, and it, that adds up. Submitting to film festivals, no, I don't, that's something that the price doesn't change on those, production does. But uh, I don't know. Did I answer that right? <laughs> yeah, whatever. You know, just drop that knowledge out there that we're looking <laughs> for. The, you know, the, your vast experience with going to film festivals. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you this: um, In an age where now you can put your film online so simply and so mm -hmm. easily and have it available to anybody who wants to see it in the world today, right now, instantly, why do you submit your film to a film festival? Why go through all the hassle of paying the fee, tr making the travel, you know, going through the selection process? Um, is, is that a, why do you do that? Actually, uh, yeah, I'll tell you why. Because I, I actually, when it comes to film festivals, for me, it's not about 
getting the film out there. It's more for like, you know, at any given time, I, I try to stay working on a few different projects. So it's more me building the stamina. Like I don't, I honestly don't even know if I have the stamina to do a feature right now, but I'm building towards it. You know, I mean, getting off a, a three-day production sometimes like totally kicks my butt, and I'm like, I can't go any further. You know, and then sometimes you know you go further, but um, for now it's sort of like. You know, I want to be able to wrap something and then come to a Q and A. You know, and not be really tired or, and have to just kind of put my body through this, these experiences in my mind, so that when the time does come, I'll do something like this. Then you fly somewhere else. Then and then you're gonna drive somewhere. It, you know, what I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I, from what I understand, famous people have very crazy schedules, and I don't. I'm, I wouldn't be ready for that if it came tomorrow. You know, so this is sort of just exercise, I guess, you know, and, and making sure that I'm ready. Uh, Clinton, what do, you, what do you think? Do you think that, uh, I mean, you can put your film online instantly, but yet you're, you're still here. So w why? why? Why come to a film festival when you can put your film online and anyone can see it right away? Well, I think they're really, they're two different things. I, I, I don't even think at this point they could be put in the same category as one another. Like, film festivals is much about, more about this and the connection up here. Uh, and it can't really compete with the raw numbers of getting eyes on your film that putting something on the internet has. But, but in terms of those, those connections, those stories, and just really you know, selling yourself and, and selling the film in a more personal manner, uh, you know, going online can't compete in something like this. And also you guys are just great hosts and stuff like that. And we don't really get all, all those same benefits of uh, when you put it online. So there's still, there's still a, a great value to film festivals, even though you, know, you don't get the same number of views. There's still, still a lot of reasons to come. Pablo, what do you think? Um, do you think it's uh, worth it to be here at the film festival when you could be sitting at home? Uh, <laughs> no, I totally worth it. I, th I think it's totally worth it because um, I kind of lock myself in my studio and uh, I tinker around for hours and hours and days and then months and then a whole year goes by and it's like I'm just by myself. But coming here, um, one of the biggest things that I had on my list was I want to meet other filmmakers. I want to meet other people that are, you know, pouring their passion into this also, you know, and, and network with them and see what they're doing. So that was, that was really uh, my number one goal, you know, and I definitely the first day we got here, it was like, met her, met him, met him. It's like, we, we had a, we're, you know, right off the bat and everybody's been really nice. So this is awesome. I love it. Thank you very much. Um, Marielle, do you think um, when, you, when you were working on your film, especially in pre-production, or, or thinking about the concept, did you consider what it would take to get your film on the f festival circuit, to get it um, played at a film festival? Did you let the fact that, yes, I want to put my film in a film festival affect the, the way you planned making the film or the way that you made it? Or did you just make the film that you wanted to make? Uh, really not at all. It didn't, it, I didn't really, th I mean, the only thing that we really thought about was length because, um, the kind of tried and true thing that we've all heard is like, keep your film 10 to 12 minutes because it's really easy for a programmer to program two 10 minute films, but it's more difficult for them. They can, if they can pick two 10 minute films over one 20 minute film, they will. Um, now having been to a lot of festivals, I don't really know if I believe that that's the case anymore. I feel like I've seen films of all different lengths and it really just has to do with, does your film fit? Is it, is, what's the quality like? Um, Honestly, I, I kind of wished we had, like I said, this was a very learn by doing process and we had no festival experience going into the production of our film. We did not plan on a line item for it. Wish we had. Um, and it's been, um, I, I will go into the next film differently. Will it affect the creative? No, because at the end of the day, then what's the point of what you're doing? Um, um, Robert, you've been to a lot of festivals. Um, has it, has it, is it something that you think about when you start making a film that I want to get on the festival circuit, so I need to make it in particular? So you're making the film that you want to make. Yeah, I definitely think, look, I'd like to go to the festival circuit. That's the whole point in doing it. And for the same reason as everybody else, I like meeting the other filmmakers and the people responsible for putting on the festivals. It's really, uh, it's satisfying, but I never think about, am I making something for a particular, I just make what I want to make and hope that do it you, turns you, out. Do you think if you jumped to making a feature, you would be forced to um, give up some of that creative I don't freedom? No, I'm a documentarian. Because they need to make a commercial goal with a feature? No, I'm a documentarian, and you go into that knowing there is no commercial 
<laughs> end game. So, I mean, seriously, there's just not. That's the way it is. And I love feature films and I'm obsessed with them, but it, as far as my own strengths and weaknesses, I, I know that I'm much better at making documentary and it's something I love doing and it's, uh, it's always been a passion for me and I'm sure I'll make a feature sooner or later, but even when that time comes, I won't, I won't worry about the subject. I'm just gonna make what I wanna make. Yeah, great. John, what was the biggest challenge you overcame making your film? What was the hardest part of it? This was this was a longer film for you, more, longer than um, some of the other ones that, that we've seen. Yeah, man, I'm working towards the uh, towards the feature. So it's just it's um, getting bigger and bigger. What was the biggest challenge in, in much longer film? Well, actually, this is the first thing that I've been in. I, uh, actually, ever uh, as far as like a, a lead. And everything, so uh, I, this is what happened. I, I have I have a co-director on this one, and the reason why is because we we decided to kind of we always got together and, and and wrote or sort of just came up with concepts, but we never did anything. We both have cameras, and it's so easy to make a film. Not that it's easy, but it's a lot more accessible, you know. Um, so we said in 24 hours we're gonna have a story, and that story, you know, one of us. We're both gonna write different stories, and and then we'll pick one, and we'll do it, and just do it. And um, I come from just being solo always, you know. I write and direct alone, and um, but this time I just wanted to do it. And it's sort of I, this, this happens to me a lot, where I'll, I'll do a project and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and sooner or later you have a few thousand dollars that you've you spent, and you're like, I don't know. Now, now there's more. We weren't even thinking about film festivals for this one. You so, know? so your project kind of rolled out of control on you. Okay. It was working with the co-director. That was so That's different, big challenge. but made so much sense for this project. Yeah. Now, Lisette, you must have had some big challenges uh, with your limited budget. Um, <laughs> what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome? Oh man, which one do I? Pick? Was everybody hungry? It was <laughs> only twenty dollars. <laughs> no, we actually had good food. Um, no, it was okay. So the way that I made this film was that um, I had actually just finished a, like a. $15,000 short film, and I was so stressed from that that I was like, I just wanna make something small. And um, I was editing the other short film and just called my DP and said, hey, I have this idea, you have a camera, let's shoot it. We didn't even have lights, we didn't have sound, we didn't have anything. Um, so we just shot it in like seven hours at his house and I acted in it, so I didn't have to deal with um, talent at the moment, so that was easier. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I guess the hardest part there was um, was the sound and the post-production because since we didn't have a lot on set, we had to like build all of that um, afterwards. And I was living in LA, this was happening in New York, you know, we were doing stuff over Skype, over WeTransfer, over, God, what else were we, like, uh, we recorded our ADR over voice memo app on iPhones. Like, I think getting all of that together, um, that was probably the biggest challenge, but it was actually really fun. And if anything that I learned from that was like, they're really, you can really make a movie if you just want to, you know? Um, and it's really like, there's gonna be challenges, but you know, you can overcome them no matter what you're doing. So, Great. so you can make films or make excuses. Absolutely. And, and, and um, so if somebody came to you and said, you know, I've never made a short film and I saw yours at this film festival, um, what, uh, what, uh, but, but, uh, so I want to make this film, but I don't yeah. have this piece of equipment that I need. Yeah. What would you tell them? Okay, so the I don't have thing. That is my favorite thing to hear because I can shoot that down in 10 seconds. Because uh, what it comes down to for me is the difference between wanting some, to do something and surrendering to do something. Because when you, you, when you want to do something, like, that's a desire and that's great. Like, I believe you. You want to be a director, you want to be an actor, you want to be whatever. I'm 100% down for you. But, you know, when like you're like in the nitty gritty where you have to make the choices of I want to do this goal or I want to eat tonight, you know, your your want is gonna go where your desire is and that's gonna be probably not in that can of baked beans and I'm telling you this from experience. Um, but when you're surrendered to do something, it's different because there's nowhere to go from that. It kind of makes your choices for you because when you're surrendered, you're just like, okay, well, 
I have these two options, but I've already surrendered to this option, so I have to do that. So like, you're never gonna have enough to do what you wanna do, really. Um, you just have to find, be resourceful, find your way around it, and um, it'll really, really um, benefit you in the end, I think. So, you know, I, if I handed you a budget of $10,000, or if I handed a filmmaker a budget of $10,000, yeah. all of a sudden they'd need twelve. If it was 100000 they'd need 200000 There's always going to be more that they yeah. want. There's always going to be more. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, don't, don't let that be your deterrent. Like, if you don't have enough money, you don't have a camera, you don't have whatever, you're never going to have enough. And if that's, your op if that's your choice, like, if that's, um, not your choice, but if that's, like, what's holding you back, I mean, just stop now because it's going to especially if you're starting out right now, when you're starting out, you're never gonna have enough. You're not, um, unless you, you know, have an uncle or whatever you have. Um, but yeah, if that's, if that's what your excuse is, then you know, there's a lot of other people that have a lot less that are still making this stuff happen. And you can, you can. It's just, what that really is, is that that's just fear. You're just telling yourself, like, I don't wanna do it. I can't, I can't do it. So it takes like, you know, you put yourself in the victim mentality so that you can uh, get by with not doing it. Yeah. So you can make a film. Yeah, you absolutely yeah. can. You it's absolutely can. Just can. tell your story. Good. Yeah. Good. Robert, what what do you think about that? Do you think if do people come to you and say, I want to make a documentary like what you're making, or I think that's really interesting, I want to do that, but I don't have or I can't? Documentaries, it, it, barring travel, food, et cetera, they're basically free to, to make right now. If, if you can find something to make locally, if you have access to a camera and editing software, you can make a movie. It's, I always tell kids, uh, my students, that the barrier to entry is your creativity and your ideas, not the equipment. That if you want to make it, make it. There's, there's nothing stopping you from doing so. Do you think it's difficult to come up with a, a, an idea for a good documentary, a good idea that, makes, that would make a good documentary? Yes and no. I'm not a person that, uh, I'm not a person that sits down and thinks to myself, okay, I need to make another film, and what am I gonna do? I just wait until it, it comes to me. So uh, in the, the way I do it, I get a lot of grants for my work. I've got a lot of like national humanities grants and things like that. I have never once written a grant application that was honest. Um, they weren't technically dishonest, but they were kind of creative nonfictions, um, if you will, and what I mean by that is I always make up a film that I tell them I'm going to make and never once have I actually made that film. Uh, but every time I've made a film, but I don't know what I want to make, I will just, I'll just make something up and say, this sounds like a great idea, please give me money. And if they give you money, they don't care whether or not you make that film, they care that you make a film. So as long as you have a, a proof of concept that you did something creative with the money. It's not an issue, but for me, it's the inspiration strikes what it strikes, and you never know when that'll be. Well, you can you can plan your whole film out. You can make a script. You can make a budget. Make a distribution plan, or you can just pick up your camera and go out and make a movie. Uh, neither way is is wrong. Either neither way is incorrect. Um, did everybody write a script aside from Robert? Everybody wrote a script. Yeah. Tell us about your script, Pablo. What was a what was a, a challenge you had in writing your script? Did you have any difficulties there? Just getting it down, really, you know, forcing myself to write every day to get it down, you know. Um, is, that, I, is that something you enjoy doing, is writing scripts? Um, I wouldn't say that. It, it's not like the first thing, you know. I like putting them together, uh, most post-production, that area. But, um, and I like pre-production. The writing part I find a little bit more difficult for myself. Uh, but, you know, you, I just have to make a goal. I need to have this done by this date, and that's going to take one hour every day until that date to get it done. So I need to work on it. And I force myself every day. Got up early, first thing, boom, write, you know, 15 minutes to an hour or more or less, you know, until I can do it anymore. And then I went on about my day and just like put up, I'm weird, I, get, I put like alarms on my, cl on my phone. It's like, <laughs> right, okay, you need to go right. Okay, let's go right, 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 right. Then it's like, now you can stop, okay. Now I can stop and have the rest of my day. So, so you make it a routine to, to, yeah. to write. What, what about you, Clinton? Do you make it a routine, or do you, do you uh, just do it when you need to write a script because you're anxious to go make a movie? I'm definitely working on my routine right now. I think that's one of my weaknesses, but I know that there's value in consistently working on something because I think the more you iterate, the more drafts you do of your story, especially in a short film when you have such a 
limited amount of time to bring the audience in. Every moment matters so much, and you can't really have any weak or dead moments because that, that weakens your whole structure of your film. And so going through that process of like writing every single day and, and doing more drafts and, and refining the moments to their best place, it gives you the best chance to succeed when you actually go into production. So. Uh, there was a question I asked last year I want to ask, uh, and we'll make this the last question before we turn it over to the audience. Um, Marielle, if, uh, if directing is 90% casting, what's the other 10%? <laughs> is directing 90% casting? If 90% if, uh, of directing is casting, what's the other 10%? Uh, for me, it's persistence, I guess. I mean, I think my scripts and, and the ideas that I'm drawn to tend to be really ambitious. Um, I like, I, I want to direct action films, so everything I write has some crazy car flip or explosion or something. Um, and it's kind of, for me, the 10% is, is persistence, is convincing myself and, and the rest of my team that like we can do this and we don't need millions of dollars to do it, but yeah, just go out and do it, I guess. What about you, Clint? What do you think? What's the other 10%? Uh, for me, I always just try and focus on uh, communication and how I'm communicating with all of my collaborators and making sure I'm uh, com communicating all my ideas very clearly so that everybody understands because I feel like, especially in a short film, once your team or you with your actors, you get on different pages, they can cause a lot of conflict and then things aren't really coming to fruition like, like you uh, want them to. So if you can just do something as simple as be a good communicator and be really uh, cognizant of how you're... you're Expressing your ideas to your collaborators it gets a long way. Okay. Pablo, is is ninety percent of directing casting? Is it? Uh, oof. I don't think so. I, I I focus a lot on the pre-production of it and having my ideas, storyboards. Everything's like for me. I'm a little OCD in that aspect, so it's like I have to draw every single thing, write every little detail, so that when I go to someone because I have no money and they're you know, they, they've been working in the business a little bit more. They, they see that I've put a lot of effort into, again, communicating my ideas out there. And I think with this particular project, um, that helped me out a lot because um, they, they told me that's why they did it. That's why they came aboard. Great, great. Well, it was fun uh, to speak with all of you today. We're going to take some questions from the audience. And uh, we have a volunteer with a wireless mic. And we'll, we'll take some questions if there are any. Whatever you want to know, now's the, the good time. Yeah, from uh, conception to conclusion of your film, I mean, uh, as far as time, how long is that? And the reason I'm asking is because the, um, the greatest Spanish writer, uh, Garcia Marquez, the guy who wrote A Hundred Years of Solitude, when he wrote a book of tales, he said that as far as his effort was greater for doing short stories, than doing a novel. So the way I see it, short films, I think is very similar. Okay, so from inception to final delivery, uh, Marielle, how long did it take you? Just real quick, how long did it take? Uh, I think it took us four months for actual production and then post took about a year and a half. Okay, Clinton? Uh, I uh, created my film in conjunction with Florida State University, and so I was working through their process, and the entire process took uh, about a year. We conceived it in September and finished it in August of last year, so. Okay, Pablo, how long from the, the day you, you wrote uh, Fade In? Right, to, uh, um, mine yeah. took about a year and a half. About uh, a year? Yeah, about a year, a little over a year, until delivery, we finished in August, we started. Robert? Mine took about four months. Um, we went from, I shot about 40 hours of footage, again, as a documentarian, I'm kind of obsessive. Uh, we went from 40 hours to 11 minutes and 41 seconds in four months. But I also edit as I go along, and a lot of people don't do that. And for me, it's a much easier working process to do that. So I definitely edit as I go along. I've all, I haven't always done that, but I have for a long time now. Okay. So. said how long from beginning to end? Uh, about three months for three months. Rafa Lone. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm more like the churn and burn director. Or like, you know, I think at this stage in my life or where if you're starting out, just get as much work as you can out there and get your name out there as much as you can and just you're going to get better with every project. Obviously, put everything that you can into it. But, um, yeah, I think this the more work you can put out, the better you're going to get and the more traction you're going to get so that when you do get to your, that big, big passion project, you know, 
um, you'll have a little bit more of a history to back you up. That's really what it's about, backup. You need to have something to show for yourself. Cool. John, how long from beginning to end? Six months. Six months. <coughs> it was like a, I'm like you, you know, I, I want to get products done in less than a month. And since I had a co-director and we both run companies, it was really hard to get our schedules aligned to edit. That was the biggest part. We actually wrote it, shot it in like less than a month. And then scheduling it took months to get that it done. So sometimes life gets in the way of filmmaking. That's yeah. the way it is. Who else has a question for our panel? Yes, Alan. Um, especially those of you uh, who've been to multiple uh, film festivals, what makes uh, the, bold, the, dam the Damn Short Film Festival unique in film festivals? So for who, who up here, this is their first film I'll festival. I'll take this one. OK. Um, <laughs> this city's great. Um, actually, I think I come, I, we've, we've talked about it, and this is like, actually, I've, I've been to a quite a bit of festivals, but this is like my favorite one, because I feel like it's mine. Do you know what I mean? It's like a, it's, it's like a festival that I'm not really here to um, try to climb any ladders. You know, I'm here to just be a peer, and I think that's the coolest part about this festival. You know? who, who else has been uh, on the circuit? Barbara, what do you, what do you think? I know it's your only second, your second day here, but. It is only my second day. It's my third film here, uh, actually. This is the first time I pick and choose where I go, and it worked out this time when I left uh, Washington State day before yesterday. I left four feet of snow, uh, and I got off the plane in Las Vegas and saw the sun, uh, palm trees swathed in sun, and I knew it was going to be all right. Uh, and it, and it's, definitely, it's definitely turned out that way, but in my experience, one of the biggest problems with I've been to some pretty high-end festivals, and a lot of them don't treat short filmmakers the same way they treat feature filmmakers. Um, and that's always kind of a bummer where you're like, the, this filmmaker's going to this party, but you can't go because you don't have that pass. Um, they really bifurcate between short and feature filmmakers. And so a festival that's exclusively devoted to short, fest, uh, short films is just it's fantastic. Ken? Um, one of the toughest nuts to crack for me has been um, learning how to co-write with people. Um, and John, I know you touched on your your process of, uh, of of how you would collaborate with someone in in the you know development and pre-production stage. But um, it it's always been difficult for me to co-write, uh, even with other super talented writers just like me. Because um, <laughs> it, it, it can be easy to, to kind of stall each other, like, nah, that's not quite perfect yet. So I wonder if you guys have any experience co-writing and, um, and if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, who besides John has uh, written a script with someone together? Clint, go ahead. Has it been a difficult process to work with somebody else? Writing is a, often a solitary art. Um, it, when you write with somebody else, is, are there, does it get, become more difficult? Uh, I, I like uh, writing with somebody else. I like that, that additional level of collaboration. You, uh, especially when you have somebody you're really uh, in touch with, you, know, you, you keep each other motivated and keep each other going. But I think it's really important to make sure you guys are always on the same page because it, when you get off the same page and you want different things for the script, that's when a lot of those conflicts can occur. And especially, it's really easy in like a, a co-writing uh, kind of relationship to have a lot of passive aggressive sort of behavior going on. And that all comes with like not just being in touch with each other and being honest and open with each other. I think if you can keep that honesty going and, and keep on the same page and not, not be hurt by the criticism one another get, uh, gives to each other, then, then you have a really good relationship and you should hold on to that as tight as you can. Yeah. What's that, yeah? Sorry. Um, just real quick, I think with the, I didn't, I've never written a co-written uh, co a script, but I did co-write a, a book a, a few years back. And the biggest thing for me um, and that I've found from other people is getting rid of your ego because that's really like, that's the part that's, gonna stop you you know it's like I want this and then you have to ask yourself why you want that and if the why you want that is to prove something then that's probably when it's not best for the story so a good checklist um, for co-writing for me is to 
just keep um, you know the overall heart of the story. And when we, you know, you're gonna get ideas and they're gonna go this way and that way and this way. But if you can go, okay, is this is the why because it's helping the heart of the story or because it's fulfilling some need that I have, then that's gonna help you just kind of stay on track about what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't argue with that actually, but. I think, uh, do you have a lot of friends that are writers that are friends first? Or are, they, you, are you friends with them because they're writers? Okay. Well, see for me, if I'm a friend with somebody and we can talk about filmmaking all the time without talking about making something together, when we do talk about making something together, you speak the same language and I mean I was like that a long time for a long time where I just wanted to write alone and anything anyone said was not as good as what I said so or not as good but just not what I wanted to do but I would say it's a combination of getting rid of your ego and being really good friends first and then I feel like you guys just speak the same language and there's you know yeah if you stick to the story and not your own fulfillment then yeah I think that's the most important yeah I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your background in terms of uh, whether or not you went to school in film or media arts or you just sort of fell into this uh, without any training at all. Mariel, um, what's, what's your background briefly? <laughs> did, you, did you study for this or did you just fall into it? Um, I studied film in college, but it, it was not a traditional film school. It was, um, I did not come away with any kind of technical knowledge. I picked that all up out here. Um, and I have been very blessed the last five years to be working in reality programming, um, but my focus has been on uh, retelling true life stories, so stuff like Discovery Channel and Animal Planet survival type stuff. Um, and because of that, I think that that's, I was lucky, it, working in that world has been like film school for me because you're forced to pick up everything technical. Clinton, what do you think? I'm a big uh, film school kid. I did my undergrad here at UNLV in film, and I just recently graduated from Florida State University with my MFA in film. And there was about a three-year gap there, which I think was actually very important to my education as well, because it really, uh, that was a time where I rededicated myself to it, and um, I was seeking knowledge on my own outside of the school environment, which I think is very important as a filmmaker, because if you're not constantly learning and getting better, you're getting worse. Uh, I did not go to film school. Um, my background is just, uh, I have a library card. And um, there's a library uh, down the street from where I work. Uh, so I used to just go in there and take out like 10 books at a time and read them. Uh, they had movies, so like Criterion Collection is my film school. I just so it's certainly not necessary to go to film school to make films. Any, anybody can do it. Um, no, definitely not. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, sorry, definitely not. I just wanted to speak on the other hand. Like, I definitely went to a film school where um, it was like that was the mentality. I would go to film school and get, um, you know, get the networks and all of that. But I've been out of now for a few years, and I've actually learned a lot more on set than I have than I did in school, um, and a lot more just through practice than it is. School is great, especially for networking. I think that's the best thing that you take from a film school. But it has, you know, it's not the measure of how far you're going to go. Um, is there one more, Ken? We'll take one more. Um, yeah, we'll get to see all your films this week, and we're excited. Um, Mary, Marielle, you touched on this, that you'd like to direct action films. I'd be curious to hear from all of you. We're going to get to see a sampling of your work. What is your dream and goal at the end of this journey? I know, you know making art is a process, and you enjoy the journey, but what is your dream to do? All right, that's a crack. Who has a big dream? Everybody's got big dreams. John? Wait, so the question was, what was your big dream? Yeah, I mean, if, you know, there's a... Uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I want to, you know, I want to make, I want to be the next P.T. Anderson, you know? Someone like that. That just, you know, write, you write what you want to, what's in your heart. What You know, you don't really write for, you know, awards or, or, uh, you know, you just write something that that you wanted to do, that, that it's something that happened to you. And 
and you shoot it the way you want to do, and you make sure you get final cut, and you, you know what I mean? Like, someone like that, I think that's, that's sort of what I want to do. Yeah. Okay. So you want to make cool. what you want to make. Yeah, and I like blurring the lines between comedy and drama, too. I think that's something that is a skill, and I, I, I'm trying to do it, you know? I'm definitely following the Lena Dunham model where uh, we're acting and directing and just weird things. Like a really, I'm a huge fan of Guillermo del Toro and I like movies where something's just not quite in this world. It's like in, in novels, it's magical realism. In film, it's just things like Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Minds, which is the go-to one that everybody references. But yeah, um, acting and directing in films that just make you think about things because that wasn't supposed to happen. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, we talked about how you can make films or make excuses, and all of these people uh, made a film and not an excuse. So congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. Next